GLC presents Brought to you by the donations of our faithful partners Well, shalom, shalom, and welcome back to the end revealed out of the beginning. The last time we were together, we were continuing to talk about uh, agrobiolinguistics. And now we're going to, to continue along that same line, but we're continuing to identify these words in your scripture. Once again, the Bible is revealed to us through words, and the second witness of those words is in agriculture and biology, because according to the scriptures, nothing is true unless there is two or three witnesses. And so we were talking about those witnesses of the word that's in our scripture. And the last time we were together, we, were, we ended with uh, the oat, what we call the oat, or the Hebrew word for a sign, and the Hebrew word for each individual letter. So once again, we were talking about the word S-E-M, sem, how in grammar it's, it's, a, it's a word that means the smallest part of a word, and it's also the Latin word for a seed, a seed is the word, and in Greek it's the, he, it's the Greek letter for sign, as well, and when we take that word back into the Hebrew, that is the Hebrew word oat, and that is three letters. Now, on your screen, you can see that the that we have the three letters there. On the left side of your screen is the aleph, and the vav, and the tav. There's our aleph tav, which, as we discussed last time, is an identification used in the Hebrew text to describe. The Word of God, which is God, according to John 1.1. 1, 1. But the Aleph Tab, as it stands by itself, you can see at the bottom of your screen there, that that's the way it appears, It's without its vowel structure there, in the Hebrew text many times. As a matter of fact, I'm going to submit to you 613 times this Aleph Tab stands by itself. Dare I say himself in your Hebrew text. The other times that it appears, it's connected by uh, what's called a makef in Hebrew, which is, a, there's a grammatical purpose for that. Now, but the root of these two letters that describe God himself is ot in Hebrew, or the Hebrew word for a sign. And that's what that word means. And so the root of the Aleph Tav <laughs> is a sign in Hebrew. Now, these three letters, Aleph Tav, what we have done is we've taken the Aleph Tav, remember the Hebrew letters referring to the Word of God, and we've put right in the middle of, of it the Vav, or the Holem Vav, we call it in Hebrew. And the Vav is the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and its meaning is the letter of the nail. Now pay attention to that, because we're going to come back to that in a minute. So we take the Aleph Tav, Yahweh, and obviously when we get to the New Testament, it's the same word that's used to describe the Messiah, particularly in the book of Revelation. We know that he's the author and finisher. That's also a term to describe the same thing, author and finisher of our faith. According to the book of, of the Revelation, he's the beginning, the end. In English, Greek, Alpha, and Omega. In Hebrew, Aleph, Tav. And we take those two letters that are an identification of God himself. And when we put the Hebrew letter for the nail in the midst of it, now it becomes a sign. Now notice in Yochanan 1.1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and God was the Word. Now notice the phrases that the Word, Aleph, Tav, was with God, and God was the Word. And we've already established the fact that God is the Word. There isn't any, any commentator, Jewish or Christian alike, that doesn't understand that the Word of God is God. And God is the Word. So we don't have a problem with that. But some of the other language that's used creates some confusion sometimes. But I'm going to submit to you that we go back to the beginning because obviously Yochanan or John is taking you back to the beginning by even suggesting that. John's Gospel starts... Very similar to the way the book of Genesis starts in Genesis chapter 1. Now on your screen is Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In Hebrew, this is the way it would look in an interlinear Bible. Going from the right to the left, 
The only thing I failed to do in my Hebrew text here is that very first letter on the right-hand side of your screen in most Hebrew texts is twice as big as all the other letters. That's the Hebrew letter for the house. And once again, that's indicating that God's, God begins with the house. And it's not just a house, but it's a large house. It's a big, big house. And remember, I gave you the thinking patterns between Greek and Hebrew earlier, and the Hebrew thinking box was much bigger than the Greek thinking box. Now, as you can see, there are seven words there in Hebrew. Brashit bara Elohim et hashamaim ve'et ha'aretz. Now, the first three words are translated in beginning, created God, and then there's the Aleph Tav, but it's not translated in your Hebrew text. The heaven and the earth. Now that's taken out, right out of Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Now notice the Aleph Tav, the identification of the Word of God, which we already uh, all agree with is God. Notice that it's right there with God. Right to the right, next to the Word, is Elohim, translated as God. So there is the Word with God. And God is the Word. I submit to you once again that this, I believe, is what Yochanan was referring to when he makes his comments in John chapter 1, uh, verse 1. And we see this displayed clearly in the Hebrew in the very beginning that, once again, you would never see in any other language. Now, I said all that to say this. If you remember that Yeshua is standing before the Pharisees and the Sadducees, particularly when we read it in the, in the Gospel of Matthew, just before his, his uh, conversation with Peter and the disciples about who do men say that I am and so forth. And he has this conversation with the Pharisees, and he's, he showed them all these signs. He's done all these miracles. Remember the word sign means miracle as well. In, 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 in the Hebrew language, ot is not only the Hebrew word for a sign, but it's the Hebrew word for a miracle. Now remember those three letters, ot, is the three-letter root of the Aleph Tav. You don't even get down to the meaning of it until you put the Vav back into it. Now it's the Hebrew word for a sign. And so he turns to the Pharisees and he says, now I'm only going to give you one sign. He's speaking to, to people who were supposed to maintain, who were designed by God to maintain the Hebrew script, to maintain the language. They, Judah was the law giver to maintain these things. And they were the ones that maintained the covenants and the promises and the word of God according to Romans chapter 9. Did they follow and obey those things? No, we know that. But they did maintain them. Praise the Father for Judah. We should be eternally grateful for Judah. Judah. That's why we love them as well, because they have indeed maintained that whether they followed or not. But the reason why he addresses them is because they were the maintainers of the script that we just talked about of the text. And so he says, I'm only going to give you one sign. And what was that sign? The sign was the sign of Jonah in the belly of the whale, and that he will be in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. So the sign that Yeshua was given to these people who know what the Hebrew word for sign is, is his crucifixion. Essentially what he was saying to, that, to them is, I'm only going to give you one sign. I, the Aleph Tav, am going to be nailed to a cross. And so Yeshua claiming to be the Aleph Tav, remember the Hebrew letter is a nail, Right, driven right in the middle of the Aleph Tav is the Hebrew letter of the nail. And so they turn around and they see him on that hill and they see something that he claimed to be the Aleph Tav and they drew, drove nails right into Yeshua and nailed him right to the cross. The Aleph Tav nailed right there. And that was to be the sign because when you take the Aleph Tav and drive the Vav in the midst of it, now you have the Hebrew word for a sign. Now, once again, this may all be coincidence, but coincidence is not a kosher word. Now, let's go on. With that in mind, remember the Greek, the Hebrew uh, word for a letter is the individual, it's ot. Remember, it's the individual letters of the Hebrew alphabet are called signs and so forth. And according to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, the word of God that contains these 22 letters created the whole universe. The worlds were framed by the word of God, Ivrim, or Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3 says. 
And so it just so happens, and, and on your screen you see a quote from a uh, well-known scientist. If you probably have seen him on uh, Nova and PBS specials and so forth. In his book called The Elegant Universe, which became a Nova special, here's what he says. Now this guy's not necessarily a believer, but he's commenting on what he sees that's called substance and evidence as he looks out into the way the universe is made up. Here's what he says. The fundamental particles of the universe that physicists have identified, electrons, neutrinos, quarks, and so on, are the letters of all matter. The letters of all matter. Now, should that, should that surprise you that this guy and people, scientists like him, that are viewing the evidence and substance that they see, not just in a cell, but out there in the universe as, as well, have come to the conclusion now that what is making up all matter in the universe is the letters of the universe. I submit to you that the God that we worship, who is a smart God, already knew those things in the very beginning. And that man is finally figuring some of these things out. Okay, let's move on with our words mean things as we continue to trace these things back to what the words mean from the beginning. How they're embedded in all the agriculture and biological things we see all around us. For instance, in Romans chapter 11, we read about the wild branches grafted into the natural tree. Now, the... The word that's used from the Greek and from the Latin to describe that grafted shoot, that, that process, right when the branch meets the tree that it's grafted into, right where it meets there, that is called a scion, S-C-I-O-N, S-C-I-O-N. Let's go back to the board and let's write that up on the board for just a minute. That is called a scion, grafted shoot. This is what we refer to it as, pronounced scion. Now, that is a Latin term that means a descendant or an offspring. And we use it in our culture to describe a branch grafted into a tree. Now, once again, this shouldn't shock one, any of us that the grafting of a tree is also a, a, a biological term or how uh, a descendant or a child of one person. So Paul's, uh, the Holy Spirit, if you will, through Paul, is going to use all these images in these two trees that we see in Romans chapter 11. Remember the Bible begins with two trees. We have two trees mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 37. And then we go to Romans chapter 11. Once again, we have these two trees, a scion, a descendant, or an offspring. Now, it just so happens that this word scion is... Is, comes from the Hebrew word Zion. That should sound familiar to, to some of you. Let's go back to our screen here. The Hebrew word Zion is where we get the English word or Latin word Zion, which eventually in English becomes a grafting in. Something that's grafted in is what this word means. And so there's a direct relationship between what's going on here in Romans chapter 11 that comes right forth from the scion. Now, when you, when you graft a branch in, that scion there, that branch becomes a daughter, if you will, of what it's grafted into. And so the Bible talks a lot about the daughters of Zion and so forth. So those words should sound familiar to you. Okay, now moving on. We're also going to talk about the fact that words are described in emotional human terms. So when we talk about words, that's language, we talk, use them in emotional terms like passive and active and accusative. And we use the words voice and gender and person and moods. Words have moods, see, because people have moods. We also notice that verbs are, have stems and roots, we are told. Stems and roots. Now, there's a very familiar term that we use in languages and agriculture called a phylum. P-H-Y-L-U-M. Phylum is a division of plants and a division of language stocks and cognates. So it's a word we use of plants 
And it's a word we also use in languages when we're talking about language. Once and again, this should come as no surprise to you. In the literary world, in other words, those of us who write books and write letters and so forth, in the literary world, we have a letter head, then we have the body of the letter, and then we have footnotes when we write books and so forth. So we have a head, a body, and we have footnotes. Once again, that should come as no surprise to you. Now, in Hebrew, the word amar, aleph, mem, resh, amar, is how we pronounce that, is the Hebrew word for speaking. It means to say or proclaim. It's, it's the tops of trees and so forth. So the Hebrew word for speaking, which is what humans do, is also the Hebrew word for the tops of trees. As a matter of fact, this is one of the verse first words that you have revealed in your Bible. Vayomer Elohim is one of the first phrases you have in the Bible. And technically in Hebrew, and said God, translated in English, and God said. So it's a word that's used for humans speaking, but once again, it's also the word for the tops of trees. In Isaiah chapter 17, verse 6, it says, Yet gleaning grapes shall be left in it as the shaking of an olive tree, Two or three berries in the top of the uttermost bough. Now that word uttermost bough of the tree in Hebrew is from the root amar. We know that the trees in the field clap their hands. And we know that the trees speak to us. As a matter of fact, I believe several times the Messiah mentioned things like... If, if he could, these rocks should cry out and things like that. I could make uh, uh, children of Abraham of these stones and things like that. Is, is some kind of the words that, uh, that Yeshua uses. So in Hebrew, the word for speaking, the word for tops of trees. Now, why is that true? Because when a tree, remember in, in Psalm chapter 19, verse 1, we're told that the creation and the heavens, God's creation, declares His glory throughout all the earth. And there is no speech nor language where their voice, whose voice? The heavens, the creation, all th things that God has created, that's who he's talking about. There is no place where their voice is not heard. So when the wind, in Hebrew, wind is ruach, translated as spirit in the English. When the wind whips through the trees, remember we quoted earlier that as the days of a tree, so are the days of my people. As it whips through the trees, the sound that you hear the trees speaking comes off the tops of the trees. So the Hebrew uses it as if the tree is speaking themselves. Okay, moving on. It's also true that if you've ever tried to learn Hebrew, if you've ever had a Hebrew teacher and they're teaching the language, one of the first things they do is teach you how to articulate the individual letters, those 22 letters, whether they're in their uh, normal form or they're in their sophite form, which is the fi five final forms, they're still pronounced the same way. And so many Hebrew teachers will teach you how to articulate the individual letters by grouping them into uh, groups of letters that sound alike. And we have words for that. We have uh, letters that are called dentals. We have letters that are called palatals. We have letters that are called gutturals and letters that are called labials and sibilants. Now, the reason we do that is because one of the things that's unique about the Hebrew language is not only do those letters sound alike, have the same kind of sounds, but in many cases... Uh, you can substitute those sound-alike letters inside and out of a Hebrew word, and the Hebrew word still maintains its same basic definition. That's something that's in the deep end of the pool and probably don't have time to go into right now. But Hebrew is unique, and I cannot overstress that. And so labials, the, the Hebrew labials, are letters that you say with your lips. See, grammar, bodily, body parts, lips, bet. Vav, pay. You say them by popping the, the, the letters off your lips. Sibilants are Hebrew letters, tzadi, samik, shen, sen, so on and so forth, that you say by rushing air through your teeth, so you call them sibilants. Dentals, dalet, tav, tet, are letters that you say by putting your tongue on the back of your tooth. That's what we call them dentals, and so on and so forth. The reason I'm bringing that up is because that is the, uh, there's a connection, once again, between even the way we say the letters are related to our uh, uh, mouth. What we, th what we do with our mouth is, is what this all involves. Now, in Hebrew, the letter or the word for the blossoming of a flower is parak. 
parak. Pe, resh, and chet, parak. In Hebrew, agriculturally, since all words trace back to agricultural pictures, it means the blossoming of a flower. But it's also the Hebrew word for... Um, also the Hebrew word for people who flourish. In Psalm chapter 72, verse 7, it says, In his days shall the righteous flourish. That word is parach in Hebrew. And the abundance of peace so long as the moon endureth. So the word flourish there in Hebrew is the same word as a flower or the blossoming of a flower. And so that's used interchangeably throughout Scripture as well. Now, I want to stop and spend a few minutes. As a matter of fact, it may behoove us to go to our board now and show you this, the, this word bar in Hebrew. You'll notice that in Hebrew, many words that begin with the bet and the resh have very similar meanings. Okay, and that's why they begin with those two words. Now, remember I told you that this, the labials in Hebrew, which is the bet and the pay and the and the um, vav, all are words that are said off the end of your lips. So that's why we call them labials. The word bar in Hebrew, B-A-R, means of, 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 of uh, it means it's the word for wheat in Hebrew. It's the word for corn in Hebrew. And it's also the word pure in Hebrew as well. The word pure. I submit to you that the English word pure comes from the Hebrew word bar. The bet, by, by the time it got to English, became the P sound. That that's very normal. That's something that all linguists understand, is that the nature of languages is that letters that sound alike somehow end up just slightly getting changed by the time they go into other languages. Let me give you an example of how that's used in something that some of you might see today if you've ever been to Israel. 2,000 years ago, when you went to Caesarea Philippi, there was a, there was a, a cave-like uh, thing there on a big wall, and coming out of that cave and rushing out of that place was a big fountain or spring, a water gushing out of this spring. And in, in, in the first century... It was called Panyas, Panyas. But now it's called Banyas. Some of you have probably been to Banyas. It's, it's, it's the spring is no longer gushing through there. That is a very uh, clear picture of what's, of what's going on in the world right now. The spring isn't going through there. But at the time it was called Panyas in the first century. It's called Banyas. Now why is it called Banyas now? Because the Arabs took it over five or six centuries after the, your New Testament was written, and they, didn't, they don't have a P sound. Arabic has no P sound. So they used the B sound, and they called it banyas, if you will. Now, panyas is from the, from the word pan, which is where we get the pan god from. Panyas was a picture of the various gods um, uh, throughout the world. Pan, because pan is, is, is a word that describes all gods. Pan means all. But then, by the time the Arabs took it over, it got changed to banyas, which is the restroom in Spanish. I'm just kidding. It's, it sounds like that, but it's not even close. Anyway, banyas, banyas is what it's called now, but panyas is what it was called uh, in the very beginning. And so the B changed to a P. That happens a lot in languages. It's just the nature of linguistics. So I submit to you that pure comes from the word for bar and so forth. And so we see that uh, in our languages. For example, this word bar in Hebrew is part of our English word barley. And because when it goes from one language to the next, it many times it changes into a P, this is also, this idea of pureness related also to fruit happens to be the basis of many other words like Ephraim, for example, or Ephraim. Ephraim, the heart of Ephraim is the P and the R, and it has something to do with fruit. Remember, the wheat and the tares, Ephraim, the double uh, production of fruit, the pure if you was, where that, came, uh, where that comes from. As a matter of fact, the English word fruit 
okay, comes from the Hebrew word roots for P R R B R. And that's, see, we just softened it to that kind of F sound as it becomes the word for fruit as well. As a matter of fact, give me another example. Barn. Barn in English. B A R. See, the barn is where what? The barn is where you store the wheat and the corn. And so it becomes the Hebrew word or the English word barn, as a matter of fact. Now, remember, this is also the word that's at the heart of the word Hebrew. Hebrew. So the heart of the word Hebrew in, by the time it gets in the English, also becomes pure. And so that's one of the reasons why in Zephaniah, God says in the latter days, he's going to restore the pure language which comes from the heart of the word Hebrew because the B's and the R's and the P's and the R's have similar meanings and they're sound alikes. Remember the sound alikes, they, they're both labials in Hebrew. And you see this all throughout scripture where these things, as a matter of fact, give you another example, forum is one of those words. Farm, F-A-R-M, is from the P and the R. See in Hebrew, the P sound, the P has a hard sound, P, and it has a soft sound, as in photo, P-H-O-T-O. Photo is actually from the Hebrew, the P there. The P-H actually comes from the Hebrew pay, the hard sound. But by the time it gets into, uh, into English, it's softened. A lot of words are like that. That's what those of us who study languages do. We do these things all the time. So next time we'll continue to talk about this language and relate some other things for you in agrobiolinguistics, if I can spit that out. Because words do mean things. So in the meantime, cling to your roots that your days may be long and that you will prosper in everything you set your hand to do. Shalom Aleichem. See you next time. Bye-bye. Shalom, this is Brad Scott with the Wild Branch Ministry, and I hope this series of programs, you've been able to see that there's wonderful treasures in your biblical text to be found through this beautiful language that it was written in from Genesis to Revelation. I hope we can clearly see that the end is revealed right out of the beginning. And once again, there's nothing new in your New Testament. It's just true. And I hope we continue to learn these beautiful treasures as we go through these programs. If you want to contact us, there's a couple of ways to do it. You can write us at the Wild Branch Ministry or Brad Scott at P.O. Box 97, Vernal, Utah, 84078. Or you can email us at brad at wildbranch.org. Our website is www.wildbranch.org. Org. It's a really simple website. In the meantime, cling to your roots that your days may be long and that you will prosper in everything you set your hand to do. Shalom Aleichem. This program was produced by and for God's Learning Channel. If you enjoy this program, we need your support to keep this program on GLC. Please make your checks out to God's Learning Channel, P.O. Box 61000, Midland, Texas 79711-1000. Please be sure to designate where your contribution is intended. It is very important to let GLC know which programs you enjoy and support.